to see you all. Hey, Rika. Who sees everybody? I don't see Katja, but I see, uh, <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> There's a gallery view, but probably during the presentation, we should switch to speaker view so you can clearly see what the steps are. Josie. Where are my glasses? If you scroll through, Rachel, you can see more and more people. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Do you see tons of people's faces? But I don't see it. Rachel, I don't have any view of all the participants other than the hosts. Katya, go to the top and hit, um, Hit gallery view on the top right. Forest, do that. Forest, hit gallery view on the top right. And then you can see all the faces. So that I can we see the people so I can make personal references to people. So this it looks, looks like a square of squares. I see Sarah Harris. I see Sarah oh, Harris yeah. and I saw Ulrika Citron. Sarah, mazel tov on the bat mitzvah this morning. Oh, hi. there, hi, hi, Elisa. Oh, so, so many great, familiar, fun. Thank you all for being here. This is so yeah, much fun. This is wonderful. Hi, Linda. It's so moving. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is so moving. So it's, um, it's after seven. So. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. We're so happy you're here. Um, I have all, all I have to do tonight is say welcome and happy to see you. And then I'm going to bake challah. And um, but thank you, thank you, thank you, Katya my and Rachel. Um, uh, it is such a treat, really. You are, your generosity is overwhelming. Um, so thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Nikki Duval, um, who is going to do the rest of the introductions. Thank you, Ariella. Um, so everyone, welcome. Um, it is our great pleasure to welcome our Chala gurus, um, Katya Goldman and Rachel Rengler. Um, I think they can correct me when they take over, but I think this is the 13th year that they've been running the Heschel uh, Hollow Baking Class, along with um, Patty Patricia Udell, who's also helped them along the years, and, and other uh, teachers. Um, Katya brought her Hollow Baking skills to the Upper West Side when she moved back to Manhattan about 25 years ago. She has worked as a professional chef and has authored several cookbooks. Katya has four children, all of whom are with her right now. Um, and her youngest twins, Isaac and Sophia, graduated from the Heschel High School two years ago. Rachel Ringler is a food writer. Uh, she's as I've been told, an amazing chef and hollow baker. Uh, she is a disciple of Katya's, as are many of us in the Heschel community, myself and Lisa included. Um, she, her three children, Alana, Sam and Talia, all attended the Heschel School and her youngest graduated around 10 years ago. Uh, today, they both make color regularly. Uh, they pass on their knowledge to friends, to groups, or anyone who shows an interest. Uh, because challah is not just challah. Challah is a metaphor for so much that is good, and tonight it is the dough that binds us all together. Uh, you will um, all be muted as, Chala, as Katya and Rachel teach, uh, but you, if you have questions along the way, chat them to Rachel. And, uh, and all questions will be, as many questions as they can, can be answered along the way. And without further ado, I turn it over to Katya and Rachel. Thank you. Hi, welcome everybody. I, this is really exciting. It was, we were sorry then we had to cancel the in-person class at school. And the first thing we're gonna start with, um, a lot of people got the recipe you got the recipe ahead of time. And um, the first thing I'm gonna do is talk about proofing the yeasts. Very many, many people have um, trouble finding yeast. There's dry active yeast, there's instant yeast. Instant yeast doesn't need to be proofed, 
but you can proof instant yeast. So we are gonna go ahead and do that. Uh, you can get yeast, we're doing a one packet. That's one of these packets. I get yeast um, in large containers. So I'm gonna do one table. This, is, this tablespoon measure is equivalent to two and a quarter teaspoons. So we're gonna put that in there with one cup of warm water. And when we say warm water, it's the temperature, and this is really key, it's the temperature that you would serve a, a baby's bottle. It's warm, but not hot. If it's hot, it will kill the yeast. And what we're doing in proofing is making sure that the yeast that we're using is alive and active. So I'm adding the cup of warm water. Can everyone see? and a pinch of the sugar. And I'm doing this first. And then as Rachel says, um, this, at, this takes about 10 minutes. So what we usually do is do, start with doing this and then mise en place everything, which means to measure everything out and have it in its place. That way when, when it's hectic and you get interrupted or somebody, the phone rings or something happens, you've got everything out and you got, you'll know that you didn't add the salt or you at the oil or all the sugar. So as you can see, the, the yeast is beginning to pop a little. Can you see that? Move, move it closer to you, Katja. Closer to me, okay. And so it's beginning to- Doing this now with you. Right, so everyone is doing this now. So basically you put one packet of yeast or two and a quarter teaspoons of Just froze. Is it frozen? And foamy. You are then move it to a little bit of a warmer place. Okay, and Rachel's gonna explain mise en place while we're talking. So, so basically you have the warm water, you have the yeast and the sugar. It's going to take 10 minutes until it proofs. And when it proofs, it looks like a cloud forms over the top of the water. When you have that cloud, you know that the yeast has proofed and it's ready to go. So during those 10 minutes, what I like to do, and what Katja does as well, is what is called en français, mise en place, which means put in place. It's like being on a cooking show in your own kitchen. You measure every item out perfectly. You'll have a little bowl of salt, a little bowl of sugar, a little bowl of honey, so that you don't forget anything. Because I have been making challah for, I don't know, 20 years. And whenever I act like a big shot and I decide that I don't really need to measure it out, I'll just throw it in. And then the phone rings, or then somebody asks me a question and I could never remember. It happened today when I was preparing with Katja. I was talking to you and I said, Oh my God, how much salt did I just put in? But I had measured the salt. I didn't remember if I'd put in one teaspoon or two or three, but I had measured it, so I just dumped the rest of the salt in instead of me So everybody, pretend you're on a cooking show, get the bowls out, do it every time you're making challah. So you use those 10 minutes to measure the flour, the sugar, the honey, the salt, etc. And there's a trick about the honey, right, Katja? Yeah, there is a trick about the honey, which I'll, I'll show you now. The one thing that I don't com we don't completely measure out ahead of time is the honey, because when you pour a little oil in your measuring cup, you're, and we're gonna be using an eighth of a cup of honey. Which is two tablespoons. That's right. two tablespoons of honey. And I like to use dark honey, but whatever you can have. I love the, the full flavor of like a buckwheat honey. So here's, you measure out the honey into it. And then it will completely pour right out easily. Which so I'm gonna tell, show you in a second. She's lining, she's lining the measuring cup for the honey with a slick of oil. So right. that when she pours the honey into it, and then when she wants to pour the honey into the bowl, it pours right out. It doesn't get stuck to the container. It doesn't get stuck, and it just comes right out and slides right out. So I did it in a separate thing because I'm not ready to put it in yet. But does every, can you see how foamy the... Closer to you. Can you see the foamy -ness? I can see that it's foamy. Yeah, I, every, I okay. 
So it, it, it actually looks almost like a, cappuc uh, uh, a latte, it has a little bit of a cappuccino-y foaminess on top. And then we're gonna add, now I'm gonna add that honey, which I, is, and the rest of the sugar. And then we're gonna add some of the flour. Now I've measured all the flour out here. And what we're gonna do is um, I hold back a half a cup of the flour so that when you're first learning how to do this, you, every, you, as Rachel, when we said before, as much as you need, as much as it feels like is right. So to pr make sure you don't over add flour, I hold a little bit of the measured flour out because depending on how long the flour has been on your shelf, how many, how humid it is out, all kinds of conditions will determine how much flour, the amount of liquid in your bread will actually absorb. So it can be a range, which is why our recipes give ranges. And you can always add more flour, but you can take out the flour once you've added it. Cup and if you put in too much flour, the bread will be dry and heavy. So it's always better to add just a little bit at a time and to see how it feels. There can, there can be a range of half a cup of flour of how much you need, depending on how humid the day is, how dry the day is, how cold your apartment is. All of those factors will affect how much flour you need to use in the recipe. So we use a combination. Uh, when I first started teaching and first learned how to do this challah, I used an all-purpose flour. White, um, white whole wheat flour or whole grain flour, and you can vary that. But to start, given what's going on right now, we decided to go with just a combination of bread and a little bit of a combination of bread and all purpose flour. So I initially, once it's been, I'm mixing it to, to almost the thickness of a pancake batter, and you can see the bubbles forming. You can see the bubbles forming in the bowl. Can you make it so that they can see the bubbles better? Again, it should be closer to and you, Archa. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. You can see the bubbles forming. And that's what initially, before I add the, uh, before I add the, the egg, the salt, and the oil, I try to give a good beating. And I use, the, you can use a wooden spoon, a whisk. This is actually a bread whisk. It, it's not, it does a good job beating, but it doesn't have the fine, all the, like a balloon whisk. It's easier to clean later. And what I'm doing here is developing the yeast. The yeast, I mean, the gluten is the strands that give the strength to your dough. So these are the, the most important thing is that your yeast was alive and well and is now bubbling. We gave it sugar to feed it and get it moving. And now we just added, if you're using bread flour, add the bread flour first. And I'm beating it to really get the gluten activated. And then I'm going to add a little more of the flour and keep beating. And then I'm going to add now. Our recipe calls for uh, two eggs, but I have like farm fresh eggs that are not quite as big as two e large eggs. So I break the eggs and check them. One. And they're clear. Now we've we've proofed the yeast. We've added some. Uh, we've added the honey and the sugar. We've added some of the bread flour, and we're beating and added the egg. Does anyone ha had trouble with their um, yeast getting alive and bubbly? If you do, let Rachel know. 
And then I hold back um, for a little while before I add the salt and the oil because oil is a form of shortening and how fat and butters and things are called shortening is because they actually shorten the bands of the elasticity of the gluten that makes it rise. So we're just giving it an extra push on getting it developed. And also the salt will pull the water out of the structure. Okay. So now I'm gonna add the oil and the salt. So this is, as the recipe says, one and a half teaspoons of salt and a half a cup of vegetable oil. It can be a canola, a safflower, a light oil. And the big, this is where the, the muscle comes in. And people say, why do you like do this by hand? Why don't you do it in a KitchenAid or a brick? At the end of the day, this is a very centering, wonderful thing for me to do. And I really enjoy when we get into working the dough and, and pushing it. And it's hard work. It's a workout. <laughs> when my, when my, when Forrest, who's now 28 or 29, um, was little, he used to help me uh, make, make the dough. And uh, Joan Nathan was doing a, uh, a Jewish Cooking in America series. And he, I, Forrest and I, who's now 6'6", six, six, but at that point he was a little kid, um, did the, the, the program. So now as the dough gets thicker, it's pulling away and I'll keep adding flour. And once it becomes more of a shaggy mass, so it's pulling away. I guess a humid, it's very humid. I don't know if it poured there or not. And then I take this off and I start going around the bowl and just keep turning and turning. And I always have extra flour right by. So here's some bread flour and then it, it, the white whole wheat, because it seems very, there we go. So you can see that it's, if you have a hip, this is a small amount of dough, so you can almost begin to really work it in the, in the bowl. And then you lightly have, I'm gonna sprinkle some dough, some flour, so that I can put the dough onto the counter. And you see how it's still a little sticky, but that's okay. And you just keep kneading is something that you're doing. You're stretching and moving the dough out. So you push it away, you rotate it, you turn it around, and you don't want to put, and when you get your hands get messy like this, you just go like this and get all the rest of the dough right in. And then I'm gonna do this slowly so you can really see what I'm doing. I'm folding it towards myself and I don't ever pull it and stretch it and break up the strands. So we're just continuously developing it. And you want, to, you want to push it and knead it gently because if you push too hard, it makes the dough feel sticky. And then you're going to want to add more flour. And the more flour you add, the heavier and the drier the bread will be. So you want to have a light and loving touch when you're kneading the dough. This is, this is taking more flour than I usually take because I'm using so much white flour, which I don't, we don't usually use so much, but, and it's a rainy day, but 
And then again, just clean your hands off and then bring that into the dough. And you just roll it around. Now, very often when I make just two yeasts, I don't even move the dough. I have a big, heavy bowl and you don't even have to move the dough. You can do this in the bowl. And at, at the end, I'll show you that bowl. I don't want to overwhelm you. <laughs> But you know, making challah is, you know, you can, I'm, I'm not always so um, verbose, articulate. It, it, challah is a, re, a way that I show my love and my feelings to people. Uh, for years, when someone uh, passes away or there's something exciting even in, in, in my friends' lives, I'll often send over a challah on Shabbos or write, before an event or a, and it's really a lovely lovely meaningful it speaks volumes to, for you to take the time and energy to make something like this for people so so now the dough is getting smooth it's not sticky and then there's two things we can do with this dough at this point we can Take the bowl that we used before. Put a little oil in it. And then you take the dough. See, it's still a little sticky, but I prefer it a little sticky. Put it in the bowl and then flip it over so that it's and you don't have to worry about washing the bowl again. So I just flipped it over and now we're gonna let it rise for the first rise. But if you wanna let this, bake this dough tomorrow and not stay up tonight because you're making this dough until we go through. I have both that we've made ahead of time and Rachel has some dough. So we're gonna let this rise in a warm place. If till it doubles, which is about two hours. You can rush it by putting it in a very warm place, like preheat your oven to 150, turn it off, wait a little while, and then put a pan of water in there and put the challah dough with a sprinkle, a tiny sprinkle of flour like this, and then a damp a damp towel. And now it's, what's important about this towel is as you can see, it doesn't have any pile to it. It's a, it's flat, a flat, flat weave, not a terry cloth uh, towel, because if you use terry cloth, the fibers, the cotton fibers will become incorporated into the dough when the dough rises. So you want and to have a flat weave cotton towel that's damp that you put on top of the bowl. And this, and then you, you'll see, depending on what size your bowl is and how much dough you've made, you end up tying it over like a babushka and let it rise. And a warm place is a non-drafty warm place. So I said you can let it warm in your gas oven, which has a pilot, which can be warm. If in the summer it will rise faster because of the warmth and the humidity, except if you have the air conditioning on. So you have to find a warm area. Like if it's really hot in the kitchen and you left all the windows open and it's drafty, that'll slow it down. If you wanna delay and deal with this bread tomorrow, Boris, hand me that bread. You can put the dough this is a dough that I made earlier and I let rise. So you put some oil in a Ziploc bag and you rub it around. You rub the oil around in the bag, the drop in. Instead of oiling the, the bowl and you rub it around and you put the dough into the oiled bag. And then you just close the bag, the Ziploc bag. You could also put it in a bowl that has space for it to rise to double and then you let this refrigerate overnight 
And then in the morning, two hours before you want to be baking it, you take it out and bring it to room temperature. You bring it to room temperature, and that constitutes the first rise. It will have filled the bag a lot, and you punch it, punch it down, and then you let it come to room temperature. When it comes to room temperature, after like two hours, you shape it, and then you bake it. So you can break up this whole process in different stages and fit it into your life. Because I know we all hope we're not going to be home all day, every day, <laughs> forever. <laughs> so, but, but this remember, is the perfect. It's a very forgiving dough and you really can't screw it up. It's a fabulous recipe. You can let it rise for two hours and then punch it and braid it. You could let it rise overnight. There may be slight differences in flavor from the longer rise in the refrigerator, but it will still be delicious. And you can, you, you know, you'll decide, do you want light honey? Do you want dark honey? Do you want the overnight rise? Do you want the quick rise? It will all end up at the end of the day, you will have a delicious challah. And there may be slight differences in flavor that will make it your own. So this recipe that Katja is sharing I probably know 25 people who make challah every week using this recipe, and none of our challahs taste identical one to the next, because some people use only all-purpose, some people let it rise overnight, some people use dark honey, some people use light honey, some people use corn oil, other people use vegetable oil. Well, every permutation affects the end result, and it's all gonna be good. Right? Okay, yep. <laughs> So this is, this is dough that has now doubled in size. I'm gonna show you, this is the dough we just put, this is the dough that we, I just put under the cloth. And this is dough that I made um, an hour and a half, two, hour, two hours ago that rose. So you see the, t the size difference of, and then, you punch this down, which is really an exciting activity. Can I show them what a two what a two yeast dough looks like? Yes, definitely. That's two yeast. Okay, go ahead, Katja. Okay, so that so maybe show punching down your two yeast because it's really exciting. Got it. You can see all the air coming out. And that's called punching it down. So as, you, as you just saw, Rachel punched it down. The dough at this point is a lot more elastic. It's the oil on it helps you um, avoid adding more flour. And I just, again, do this, the kneading. Before we start braiding, Katja, I just yeah. want to give people a chance. If you have any questions about the mise en place, about, the, about uh, proofing the yeast, about making the dough that you want to ask, now's the time because we're now going to be moving on to the next section, which is the braiding section. Okay, so anybody have, I see, one question coming up. Oh. <laughs> Not a question, just that it was very dramatic, the punch down. Um, any okay. questions before we move on? So, Rachel, so for, for, I see some people um, raising hands and um, I just want to tell you that at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat icon. Well, that's and what I'm saying. Click on that, you can, uh, you can type in your questions to Rachel. Okay, I can answer. I see Katja is that first, some people could only find self rising yeast. What is that? Um, self rising yeast? Yeah. I don't, I don't really, I've never used it, but I think it's like the instant yeast. And the same with instant yeast, you use the same uh, quantity, correct? Yes, I do. Okay. And, um, some, and one of the other questions is, what if you don't have vegetable oil and you only have grapeseed or olive oil? The, I would use the grapeseed. Um, 
if you want it to be as close to like an Eastern European kind of sweet challah like we make. Olive oil very often, depending on the olive oil that you have, if it's an extra virgin dark organic green oil with a strong taste and a little bit of a kickback, it makes the bread a little heavier and you'll also get a little bit of that olive oily taste. But I do, but it's, it's fine in the summer, very often I'll puree basil and in olive oil and use that for the oil in my challahs. And it's delicious when I make it like a dairy dinner mm -hmm. in the summer. So I, I would go ahead and make it with grapeseed oil or with the light olive oil, or if you have both of those dual combos, so you get a little bit of that exciting taste, like a Mediterranean flavor with the olive oil. Okay, um, I just want a couple of questions. First of all, somebody asked why I used two yeast. I made double the amount of dough that, Ka that Katja made. So the one yeast recipe that you all have is enough to make two average sized challahs, the kind of challah that you buy in the store when you, for Shabbat dinner, that will be the size. It'll be about a one and a quarter to one and a half pound so challah. I made Either double way. the amount of dough. That's what I was showing all of you. That was a two yeast. And from a two yeast dough, you can make two very large challahs or three or four challahs out of that. Katja, people would like you to, and one more thing, somebody asked about the honey and the getting the honey out of, out of the container. What she was suggesting is that you line, you pour a little bit of honey into the dish that will be a little bit of oil into the dish that will be holding the honey. And then you pour the oil out of that dish and pour the honey in. And then once, you, once, once the, the um, yeast has proofed and you're pouring the honey into the yeast mixture, the honey will slip right out of that bowl because the lining of the oil will allow it to just slip right out of the bowl instead of sticking to the bowl. Katja, there's several questions about the difference between bread flour, white whole wheat, whole wheat, and all-purpose flour. Okay. Okay, so um, all-purpose flour is a softer wheat and doesn't have as high a gluten content Bread flour is a harder when a, 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 a winter bread flour, but the outside, the bran and the endosperm, the bran has been removed. Bran is like razors. If you know, imagine what like, Bran looks like when you buy it or wheat germ in in a, in a in a container it has sharp edges so wh When I use whole wheat flour, I use a mixture of bread flour with it because it has a, a, a Stronger gluten presence to compensate for the sharp edges of the whole grain meaning the from the bran so that that's basically the difference and an all-purpose flour is not too much gluten it could be used for pastry or for bread baking uh, katja always uses you always use some bread flour in your challah um use some bread some white whole wheat and some all-purpose i never use bread flour in mine again it's a it's a personal preference some people love it some, you know, it's like with the honey, it's like with the oil. I'm not a bread flour. I, I use bread flour when I make Italian breads or I make other breads. I don't use it in my challah. You get a, a, a finer crumb when you use all, all purpose and no bread flour. It's more of a, when you pull the dough, when you pull a bread that I make, Correct. it has more of strands that pull apart uh -huh. as opposed to being cakey. Yep. And that's the difference in the gluten content of the, of the types of flour and how much you work it. Okay, next. Um, you don't have to- I lost you after the kneading. What do I do about putting it in a bag? And after that, Rachel, you'll respond to that? Oh, I, I, I don't think I saw that one. Somebody okay. to you. Okay, so if um, after you knead it, you put uh, either, you put a little of the veg additional vegetable oil in the Ziploc bag and you rub it around 
so that you spread the oil and then you put the dough like this that I just have this the dough into the bag, seal the bag and let it rise in the refrigerator overnight. Does that answer your question? Uh, who who asked it? Somebody. Okay. Um, basically, the secret of challah is you need to need. Need right. is really important. And you can't just put the ingredients together, mash it together, and throw it in the, under a towel and say, oh, it's going to be fine. The dough knows. And if you don't need it, 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 the glutens don't build and it won't rise. So you'll have something delicious, but it will be flat. It won't, it won't be a, a risen kind of challah that we're all used to seeing. So the, you can't get away with not needing. You can get away with all with Rachel. different kinds of flour and different kinds of honey and different kinds of oil. But if you neglect kneading, and that doesn't mean rolling it in your hands, it means kneading and pushing against a counter against a surface. You got to do that. You don't do that. Challah doesn't lie. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you the kneading one more time before we put this dough aside and I pull out the dough to shape. So you, you, you push away from you with the palms of your hand, push and rotate, push and rotate. It's kind of like wedging clay if anybody's ever done pottery. And you try to keep it, I'm not, as you rotate it, you're not ever tearing it apart. So it keeps it, the gluten strands intact and developing. And you just keep going like that. And um, the, when I first started baking bread, the recipes would say, knead for 10 minutes. 10 minutes and how you knead, like if you just go like this, that's not really kneading. So you, kneading would be really pushing and rotating and pushing and rotating without breaking the surface of the dough. Push, turn, push, turn. And then some people do this, this throw down technique, but I prefer the sort of dance of kneading and going around. And then you bring it back to you you knead it and you go around. And because and you see, uh, it's a little sticky, but I haven't added more flour because the less flour you add, the, the better the rise and it's not as heavy. Okay, so this is the dough that rose once that I had made earlier. Now, I, you, we would put this dough aside again and cover it. And this is a dough that's risen the second rise, right? So is it, does anyone have any questions at this point? Rach, you need to, you want to clarify anything? Somebody asked if you need to um, change the recipe if you use only whole wheat flour. I just lost touch. Oh, there you are. Um, if you use only whole wheat flour, it will take longer for it to rise and um, it, it'll be more dense, right? but it'll still be delicious. And the other thing is um, I find that I, I need to add a little more salt and maybe I might a little more salt when I use the whole, the whole wheat flour. Mm -hmm. And then this is maybe a good point to discuss using kosher salt or a fine salt. Want to okay. this salt is not salt. So fine salt, a teaspoon of fine salt is not equal to a teaspoon of kosher salt. If you think of how the salt is made, kosher salt is large crystals. And when you put all those large crystals together, there's space between the crystals. So you have a much denser amount of teaspoon of salt when you're using table salt. If you want to use kosher salt, it's fine, but you would use one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt with equal to one teaspoon of um, table salt. Is that about right, Katja? Yep, yep. And also another trick, if you didn't put mise en place everything and you're not sure if you've, um, you're not sure if you've added everything, taste a little piece of the dough. 
and you can taste if it's if everything is there. If it doesn't have any saltiness or it doesn't have a little tinge of sweet. And once you've tasted it, you don't have to swallow it because some people think they'll get a bellyache, but um, from raw yeast. But if you just taste a little piece each time when you make the dough, you'll know, oh, wait, I, did I add the salt? Didn't I add the salt? Just taste it. And you'll know if you added the salt. So now I'm going to punch down this dough. So this is. Oh, we had a question about the kind of bowl, Katja. Katja? Katja? Yeah? Talk about the kind of bowl, plastic, metal, glass, ceramic, etc. Okay, when I first started learning how to um, bake bread, it always said non-metallic bowl. But I think that was before people just automatically had a lot of stainless steel bowls. You can actually let um, work in a stainless steel bowl. I usually use big, heavy ceramic bowls. Um, I, do, I, did, I demonstrated it in a glass bowl. It worked perfectly fine so that everybody could see what was going on in the bowl. But I usually use ceramic bowls. I also make like four yeasts at a time. So this is a big, wonderful ceramic bowl. And when I put the dough in here, I don't have to do it on the counter because the bowl barely moves. It weighs a ton. <laughs> so I, I just don't do, usually do it. The recipes usually say in a non-metallic bowl, but it can be any kind of ceramic bowl. I think also um, I find that uh, I, like to, I, I like it to be a heavy bowl because then it holds the warmth like a thick bowl. When, when Patty and I started baking regularly and decided that we were into this, Katja bought one of these big ceramic doll, bowls, one for Patty, one for me. And it is now, you know, I, I think that one day I'm going to pass down my oil and flour stained recipe to one child and that bowl to another one because that bowl is only used for my challah dough. It's like a religious artifact, and, right. it's heavy and it's it just it feels like from an, another time. I could see my grandmother's having used a bowl like this big ceramic bowl. That's called is it called mason? Pan? Yeah, bowl, a mason. But also, we sent out information in the in the in the material. We told you where you can get a bowl like that. Yeah. I actually have my grandmother's big mixing bowl like that. It has a crack in it, so. I use it gingerly, but I also have a speckled, like old fashioned pan that she gave me when I got married and told me I could only make blintzes in it. I, it's for making the crepes for blintzes. And I don't really do it so often, my sister does. So I recently gave her the blintz, my blintz pan so she could work a few pans. But it, it is, you know, there is something to having that tradition. Okay, so this is the, the sec this is after the second rise. And um, this with this, I usually make um, one large challah, or you can make two smaller challahs. So I'm gonna, I divide the dough. And I don't handle the, the dough that much after the second rise. I don't really knead it and beat it as much as I do in the first. So I divide the dough into four pieces. The only time that I go crazy with having things even is over Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur before. I, I make challahs for a lot of people, um, friends and, and the rabbis in my synagogue and a lot of people. And just so that I, it's like a production I weigh out the dough so that I have the same amount. So there's no guesswork with when they're done. Everything's done at the same time. It's more of a production. But when, when you're doing one bread, you can just take the, you have, I have four pieces. I take three of them. I leave one to the side and I roll ropes. And you want the ends to be a little tapered and put it 
aside, roll the next one. Now, if they're a little different in size, we didn't do I put hold it. Oh, I did. Oh, here, one <laughs> second. So I made a lot of dough earlier in the day. And if you've seen on packages or when you've bought challah, there is an, uh, it says challah has been taken. So when I use five pounds or more flour, a combination of all my flours, and we send out the specifics for you, I take a nubbin of dough from that big mass of dough and say the bracha. Want me to say it? Yeah, go ahead. It's, um, the, the essential word is lahafrish. If you know what a parsha is, the parsha hashavua is a chapter, it's a section of the week that you're reading from the Torah. So the, the bracha, when you remove that piece of dough, is baruch atah d'ashem l'kena melchala m'ashek yidshanu mitzvasav etzivanu lahafrish t'shakir chala. So that's, a, so it's the same word as parsha, it's a separation of a piece of the dough from the big part of dough. And that so, is in, do you want me to talk about that? After sure. you remove a piece that it's a, the size of a zayit, the size of an olive, um, you say the bracha, move, remove the piece and throw it in the oven when nothing else is in the oven and let it burn. And that burned piece of dough is in memory of the Mizbeach, in memory of the altar in the uh, Bet HaMikdash, in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, Oh, you're not saying no to me. No. Okay. <laughs> no, a, a, a question popped up is, can you over knead the bread? Um, in the begin, the, fir the first kneading, you can't over knead it. If you knead it so much that when uh, the second after the, se the, when you go to shape it, if you handle it too much and you, you work the dough and you can't get it to stay out, to roll out, just let it rest for a few minutes and that will relax it and it'll be in because otherwise it's like a rubber band. You'll go like this and the dough will go yeah. right back. But if you just like we just left my dough, the, the rope sitting here for just that long and it's not pulling back at all. So you, you can't really overdo it. You just have to know what to do. So if you your dough especially when my kids used to help me and I, they'd all have chunks of dough and they'd work it to death, just let it rest and it'll be able to, it, it, it'll, it'll be pliable and have elasticity and flexibility and not be like a tight rubber band. Does that answer your question? I'm just yeah. um, gonna cut in for a second. Again, I just wanted to mention if anyone does have questions, Go to the chat icon at the bottom of the screen and select Rachel. Um, Rachel is going to be handling all the questions. Um, if there's any questions I haven't answered, you can ask again. Because a lot of them coming in, I've been trying to answer all of them, but I'm sure I've missed some. <clears throat> but can we just go back for a moment to the, to the temple and to the roots of Chala? Katja? Sure. Okay, good, because I like that part. <laughs> because the, the term chala comes from the Torah. It's actually used in the Torah. And chala was originally referred to the dough that um, people who were living in Jerusalem near the temple, in the times of the temple, were, were um, told that when they made dough, that a portion of the dough should be saved to go to the Kohanim, to the priests who took it who took care of the temple. So the symbolism of that is that before you make bread for yourself, you make bread for the people who are serving God. You make, you're making the bread for God. That piece of dough that went to the Kohanim, that went to the, the priests in the temple, was called the Chala. There's no longer a temple. We're no longer feeding the priests. When we, when we pull off that piece of dough, that original name for that piece of dough was Chala. And over time, that little piece of dough came to represent the big challah that we eat. But the original term was for the dough that went to the Kohanim, who tended the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> okay. So um, someone also just asked, what about um, gluten-free challah? 
Mm. I've been experimenting with uh, gluten-free flours over the years. I can get something that has a challah taste. And by using a mold, there's a, a mold that looks like the shape of a challah, but because there's no gluten, which is what gives it the elasticity and the structural shape and size, you have to sort of bake it in a mold and you get it to look like a challah and it can have the honey and the sweetness, but it has a different crumb and a different um, situation. Okay. So now when I've made the three ropes and I'm gonna put them on parchment and I start braiding in the middle and I do over and then the upper one over, over, over. And the reason I start in the middle is because it keeps it from you doing it too tightly and then it's coming like tight at one end and up and big and then tight again. And then I go from the other side. <clears throat> Just repeating what I did on the other side. It's like braiding hair. And then you want to tuck this under. Now, you can, the dough is really happy to be moved, utched, nudged. So you can go like this. And I do it directly on the parchment because then it's easy to lift the parchment onto the cookie sheet with the dough. So I know people get nervous to move, to move it, but I'm also going to show you how you don't really need to. Um, so that's the single braid. And I then take the fourth section of dough that I put out. So now remember I divided the, the whole one yeast into four sections, three of them I just did the braid. And the fourth one, I'm making another rope. And you see, because the dough is sitting, it's really moves and it just glides through your hand. I don't have a lot of pressure under my hands. I'm just gliding out like this. It's like a dance. And then I just divide it into three. And then from these, I make smaller. And you don't have to uh, make the one long rope. You can just divide the dough into three to start. It's it's just a root, how I, it's a routine that I do because other people have said, well, why do, you, why do you have to do it that way? It seems complicated, but it's just my automatic. And see now this dough, see how it's moving in really quickly? So um, put that aside, go to the next one. Let those rest a minute because I want these to be as long as the challah that I just made. So now I'm going to return. And it just rested a minute and it, it has its flexibility. And the, the three of them aren't exactly the same shape, the same size, but it's okay. And I'm just gonna show you how the dough is really pliable and easy to work with. You could, I braid this one. So the, what she's doing is she's putting the leftmost strand over the middle strand, then the rightmost strand over the middle strand. The middle keeps changing as she's braiding. But if right. you so now, over middle, right. right over middle, left over middle, right over middle. Put seeds on it. Okay. But I just wanna show you that I just scrunch it up like this, place it on top, tuck it under on that end and give it a pinch like, it's almost like a little duck bottom and pinch this side. And then very important, you then take your fingers and pinch to a join it on the top. Katja, there's been a lot of questions about first and second rise. Would you mind going over that again for everyone? I've had a lot of questions about that. Okay, so now I'm just gonna let this dough rise for like 30 or 40 minutes and I'll sh it, it, when I poke the dough now it completely pokes back out and there's no indentation 
Can you see that? It, po it pops right back out. When I'm ready to put this in the oven after th in about 30 minutes because it's warm in my kitchen, when I poke it, it'll come back, but not completely back. And that means it's ready to bake. Um, I, I like to bake on um, a heavy cookie sheet that has some weight. I like, I like, a, I really like crust. Some people like not so much crust. I think it, it just feels more homemade. And I also like the heel of the bread. You know, you go to a restaurant and they give you a basket of bread and they don't give you the heels. And I say, can I please have the end? So I like a lot of crust. So I use a heavy pan, which helps promote um, the crust. You want to talk about the first and second rises? Yeah. So the first rise was after we shaped the bread and you put it in a warm spot. I sprinkled the you, you didn't after you made the dough. Right. Initially after I made the dough. What? It's not when you shape the bread, it's after you made the dough. You, you like after, yeah, initially. Initially we 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 make the dough. Mm -hmm. We knead it. We put it in in an oiled bowl or in a plastic bag if I refrigerate you could also put it in a plastic container with a little oil in it and let it rise until it's double in a warm spot then I you punch it down mm -hmm. and deflate all the air then you knead it and get all of that air out and then I put it aside and and let it rise a little more That's you, okay. another 20 minutes like two hours the first one and then 20 minutes the second rise? Or 40 minutes, depending on the temperature of the room. Okay. So when you do it in the refrigerator, the first rise is in the refrigerator. Then the second rise is after when it, you, you take it out and it comes to room temperature, it's gonna rise again. So both ways, there's two rises. And then I divide the dough and shape it. Right. Okay. So Rachel, you wanted to show some different shapes with the dough that you have. Do you have other things that you want to show them shape-wise? Um, I could show some other shapes. I mean, I could do this four, this four part one. Should I show them that? Yeah, do the four, the four, and then I'll do a round. Can you all see? Can you all see this? Tilt it a little more. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So what I did was I made four ropes. And I made a hashtag out of the four ropes. I put two vertical in front of me. And then the other two, I put one rope on top and one underneath. And then the other one I put underneath and then on top, okay? And then I'm going to make, this is going to be a round challah. So I take the piece of the uh, rope that is underneath the other rope and I put it on top of the, the rope next to it. Again, this piece is underneath, I put it on top. This is underneath, put it on top. This is underneath this one, put it on top. Okay, so I've done all of them. Now we're going to go back in the other direction. Now this piece is underneath this piece of dough. So I put that one on top of the one to the right. This on top of the one to the right. This one on top of the one to the right. This on top of the one to the right. And then I start again. And here, this piece of dough is underneath. I put it on top of the other dough to the left. Again, to the left, to the left, to the left. And then one more time. This is now underneath. Everyone, you can see, Katja? Go that to the right, back to the right, back to the right, and back to the right. And then I fold all the errant strands underneath. And we have a lovely round holla. Beautiful. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and we can also, you, we can uh, do it, send out a video doing the shapes again. And again, I use a metal pan. It's a pan, it's two pieces of metal with some air in between those two pieces. And I cover it with parchment paper. I'm looking to see who makes this pan. I don't know. I have to find out. If I, I can figure out the name. We can send it out. 
But anyway, this is like a, a pretty round collar using four ropes. Beautiful. You want to do one and then I'll do a six? Yep. And so, and then um, for Rosh Hashanah, everyone always asks, how do I make a round? How do you make a round? So I make, again, I make a rope, but I make one end wider. So I'm making it like this. Then I take the dough in the fat end in my hand, hold it up with my fingers and wrap around. And that gives me a crowned challah. So that's an easy version of a round challah. Um, then sometimes we'll do braids around it. So I'll take more dough like I did before and we can put a braid around it. And then the other one that we love to do is to make a, a braid. You can just do a circle like this around a Pyrex dish and tuck it under. And then for Rosh Hashanah, you bake it like this with a little water in the center on the, on the pan. And then you, when you serve the challah, you can, you put honey in and you put this on the platter with the apples standing around it. It's really beautiful. And this is also like simple and not overwhelming. It's just the basic you know, snake. You never have to buy a hostess gift again once you know how to make that. You just bring that to someone's house and they'll love you forever and it's the best gift. Okay, so I think you should do the, uh, the next demonstration and then I will show them how to brush and when the dough is ready. Okay, what I'm doing now is I'm going to show you, I hope, how to make a six strand braid of challah. And basically, Katja, did you talk about using a scale at all? I, 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 I mentioned that I do weigh out the bread to make them an ev even when I'm doing big production. Right. Like for Rosh Hashanah. So if you want like every strand to be identical, you can buy one of these um, OXO, OXO scales. I absolutely love it. I use it for everything now. And uh, if I want to make sure that the strand that, that the braids will be completely even. I measure it out so that to be sure that every lump of dough weighs the same as the next one when I'm making either a three braid, a three strand uh, challah or six. I'm now rolling out six ropes of dough. We can't see that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> There's five up to number six. Can you see that, Katja? Yeah. And what, what we do first is- But I want everybody to notice that all the strands aren't exactly even. Oh. I, I just, I think things look better when they're, Patty it, Udell it needs everything in balance and orderliness. I kind of have embraced the funky and sort of misshapened here or there. It's fine with me. And I think that you should start with that premonition and that you know it looks like you made it that you didn't just buy it from a machine shop okay and the thing is it took me years until my challah looked like a challah it was so ugly the first few years that I would like make the bracha over the bread and then quickly bring it back into the kitchen to slice it up so nobody could see how bad my braiding was but the challah was still delicious. So don't get hung up by the perfection of the braiding, the perfection of the ropes. The, the recipe is a great recipe. The, the, the aesthetic will come over time. And even if it isn't beautiful, it will be delicious. That I can promise you. So in making a six braid, you make six ropes and they're not even at all. And um, you sort of pinch them all together at the top. And then you take the second from the right most strand and you put it all the way over to the left. And then you take the right most strand and put it right down the middle. Then you take the second from left most strand and go all the way right and the left most strand down the middle. Right, second from right all the way over right most down the middle. 
Second from left, all the way over, leftmost down the middle. Second from right, all the way over, rightmost down the middle. Second from left, all the way over, leftmost down the middle. Second from right, all the way over, rightmost down the middle. Second from left, all the way over, leftmost down the middle. You're going, to be, you're going to be dreaming this at night. Uh, second from right, all the way over, all the way over all of the ropes, rightmost down the middle. Second from left, all the way over, leftmost down the middle, and then pinch it all together. And you have a six strand braid that's a little too fat at one end, but there you go. Beautiful. Okay, so now this is the bread that I shaped a, a little while ago. I'm poking it and it's been maybe 15, 20 minutes, but it's very warm in this kitchen. You see how the poke is staying in, it's not coming out. Can you see that? Yes? Here, I'll do it again over here. The poke is comes out a little, but it's not all the way out. If the poke um, comes all the way out, then you let it rise a few more minutes. If it, if it stays in and has no movement at all, that means it's overrisen a little. So when it goes in the oven, it'll deflate a little, it'll still be delicious. So if you have time, just reshape, you know, do it again, or don't worry about it. So this, stayed, we still have a little bit of poke staying. So there's a couple of different, um, as I said earlier, I really like crusty. So I really like crusty. So I um, don't brush the bread before I put it in the oven with an egg glaze. The egg I glaze, like what? I said, and I don't like crusty. Right, and Rachel, Rachel and Patty like it really soft. So they brush the, the dough with an egg wash. It's one egg and a tablespoon or two of water beaten up and then you just brush it, which I can do right now. So we'll do that before it goes into the oven. We do, Katja, you do two, one wash, right? Right, I do one wash. So I put, I do one wash before it goes in the oven and then the second wash 10 minutes before it's supposed to come out of the oven. And that way you get a softer crust. I like the soft crust. And as I said, I know 25 people who make this recipe and every person makes it differently. For some it's a soft crust, some it's a hard, some it's dark kind of, you know, the color changes, the color of the dough, depending on the flour you use. And, and uh, then, and then um, if you do, for Rosh Hashanah and for the new year, I put a little honey in the glaze. And over the years, I started doing it every Friday night because my family loves it with the little sweetness. So if you do it that way, then you want to do the first, if you're gonna do two washes, don't put the honey in the wash in, in the initial glazing because the honey will make it brown too fast. Then put a little honey in, in the glaze that's left for the second wash. And I also seed my hollas heavily. We, we like a lot of seeds. And also when the dough expands in the oven, sometimes it splits apart. And so I brush this, the, the egg wash over that to fill in the seeds. So I'm just gonna demonstrate um, just for time, the brushing without now, you know, I know it, not everyone has a pastry brush, and I was talking to Ulrika the other day, who's a fabulous, is on as well, and is a fabulous um, challah baker, and she just brushes and seeds now from the start. So this is what Rachel would do, and puts it in the oven with one wash. I then, for the second wash, add a little bit of honey to my glaze. And, and so when it's five minutes before it's done, 
if you have an instant read thermometer at about 192, I will then take it out, quickly brush it with the egg glaze with a little honey in it, heavily seed it and take it out. Now, you can seed it now or you can seed it later, but since we're, um, since we're pressed for time, I'm gonna do the seeding now. You can, uh, can I have all the seeds? So I love all different seeds and I always seed heavily in here. So this is a mixture of dark and light sesame seeds and nigella seeds. So I would go heavily in the cracks like this. And I mix zatar in here as well, which is a, uh, a Middle Eastern uh, mixture of hyssop and oregano and wonderful taste. So I'll do that and heavily seed that. And then I'll put some white seeds. And you can, you can really play around with this for weddings. I, For weddings, I make two um, big hollas. I'll make like six yeasts worth of dough, split it and make two rings that interlock like this. And I'll put white seeds on one and black on the other. So it's like the bride and groom merging. So that's really beautiful. And then you can put... Right. And then I know, I know that breads, pe people like to put these kind of seeds pumpkin seeds. I toast them before I put them in. Or you can just, you know, take a ton and just, you know, take a mixture and just throw it on and take it out. So th this is how you can do it. And the dough, as I showed, was just about ready. So now I'll put this in the oven. We bake it at a 350 degree preheated oven. Um, I always, I was a caterer years ago and I traveled always with a little oven thermometer that was separate from the, the temperature dial in, the, in an oven because I, sometimes people's ovens aren't calibrated. So I cook, my city oven, I cook at 325 because it runs really hot where I am now out of the city, um, the oven heats up really slowly and runs cold. So the outside thermometer says that it's at 350, 350 360, and in reality, it's 340, 325. So um, if you find that the dough is getting too dark and the inside is a little too doughy, lower the temperature or get a thermometer so you know what's going on in there. Hacha, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there are any other questions. Uh, somebody asked that you repeat the part about poking to ensure that it's appropriately risen. Okay. Um, I'm gonna do it on this piece of dough because I just put the, uh, I just put the other bread that I shaped in the oven. But um, <laughs> so if you can see, I'm poking and it's popping out almost completely out so that there's barely any poke. In an another couple of minutes, I'll poke it again and the poke will stay in a little more. See how it's it barely staying indented. When, when you poke it and it pops out, like two thirds of the way out, it's ready to go in. Does that help? Let's see. Here, now I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna knead this dough so that you can see it completely pop out. Ready? I'm poking it and it, there's absolute, the indentation disappears. Um. You can get, for those who've asked, the recipe was sent to you along with the invitation to the event. 
um, if you can, uh, when you click on the link, you'll get the recipe, you'll get kneading instructions, you'll even get some poetry. So um, make sure that you check the invitation. And the proportion of egg to water for the glaze, if you're using, if you're doing a one yeast dough, like we did tonight, that makes two challahs, you would need one egg and probably one tablespoon of water to mix in with the egg. However, there are people who only use egg whites on there as a glaze. There are people who only use yolks as a glaze. It's up to you. Again, it's your challah. You can try it all these different ways and see which way you like the best, okay? And, and also the piece of dough, like my kids came in earlier tonight and said, mom, something's burning. That was the piece of dough. I throw it away afterwards. But um, I know people, I get a lot of emails after the class saying, what am I supposed to do with that little nub olive piece of dough? So that I saved it to show everybody, but that's what to do with it. Okay. Let's talk about why we have two columns on Friday night. Yes. Or do you want to do that first? No, talk about it. So, you know, it's traditional to have two challahs on your table. So you can make this recipe, just make one large challah, but it's traditional on Friday night to have two challahs. And the reason is that it's another biblical illusion that when the Israelites left Egypt and they were frightened that there wasn't enough food for them to eat, Moses said, don't worry, God will take care of you. And the next morning when they woke up, there was manna on the ground. And that is what they ate every day. They ate manna. But on Friday, the Israelites received two portions of manna because God didn't want to send manna down on Shabbat. So in memory of the double portion of manna that the Israelites received in the desert after leaving Egypt, we have two challahs on Friday night. I do the Jewish stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I bake. Okay, so here's, here's a challah that I, uh, my son glazed and put the seeds on for us and I want to show you uh, afterwards. So this was the double, you, it's hard to see, but this is the double braid on top. And a few weeks ago, um, I, I had baked hollas and I needed to, uh, I decided I needed to give one of the hollas away. And my, one of my sons said, mom, where's the other one? We're supposed to have two. And I said, well, this week, the hollow on top and the hollow below are the two hollows because I really felt like I needed to give a hollow to someone and I didn't bake a ton. So um, that's another way you can do it if you, if you have a small oven or you can't bake two separate breads. You can do one double. She started talking about this and how she gives challah when uh, people have um, a death in the family, for example. It's, it's really the gift that keeps on giving this challah because we all give challahs now when people have babies for the first Shabbat, when they bring the baby home, we'll bring over a challah. When there's a death in the community, a challah. Um, I'll, I'll never forget when I was sitting Shiva coming home and having a, the challahs that, that Katja and Patty made for me. And um, it's a great gift to bring for Friday night dinner. It's a great, people never forget when you make them a bread with your hands and give it to them, never. I, I went to a home of some Persian Jews a few years ago and the grandmothers in the home didn't speak a word of English. They only spoke Farsi. But I walked in like this with two large challahs in my hands and they loved me from the start. We became lifelong friends, just in that, that exchange of homemade bread with these, with these women. Okay. Right. And, and as Rachel said, you know, um, this, everybody changes the recipe a little, everybody comes up. So when, when, uh, I guess Isaac and Sophia were in nursery school there, uh, Isaac came home and goes, how come you don't come in and make holla with us on Fridays? And the other dad comes in and so I'm standing there, to, I went in and I was helping and I turned to this man who I didn't know and I said, um, who, you know, do you, co you come in every week to bake holly? He goes, yeah, I don't have a kid in the class, but I love making holly, so I still come in when my kids are older. And um, I said, oh, that's great. He goes, yeah. And I learned from Katja Goldman. I went, 
oh, really? I'm <laughs> Katja. <laughs> you know? He goes, well, um, you taught Patty, and Patty taught my wife, and she taught me, and I'm so happy to meet you. But it was, it was like, and it, it just keeps going. It's like waves. It's really a lovely thing to share. So I hope you, this helps everybody and takes the fear out. It's just really important that you proof the yeast. Even if you're using instant yeast, what, just to get started, I suggest that you proof the yeast and have fun with it. And if, it, if you overbake it or you like it's too dry, don't worry, the next day it'll be French toast or the, on Sunday it'll be French toast. So it's, it's really a wonderful thing. And I hope everybody has the courage and the excitement. And this is the perfect time to be doing this because we're all hanging out. <laughs> and be kind to yourselves because you can't screw it up. It'll be delicious no matter what you do. Just be, just be kind to yourself and enjoy. Rachel, there's a few more questions. Um, um, let's see, I have a question. Well, somebody said this was truly wonderful, so that wasn't a question. That's nice. <laughs> oh, can you freeze yeast? Um, you can keep it in, I keep my yeast in the refrigerator. I don't yeah, freeze it. Freezer. We also don't freeze, freeze the dough. We bake the bread and then freeze the bread, but the freezing of the dough has not worked for any of us. Are there any other questions? Uh, in this? Uh, there's something, my daughter's, yeah. it, 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 it ch chiming in here. I underbake the bread a little bit when I'm going to freeze them, and then I wrap them in the parchment paper, and then I wrap it in foil. Mm -hmm. And if I'm shipping them, which I did for all my kids when they're at school, I then put it in like a heavy Ziploc bag. But when you freeze it, take it out that that a few hours, like that morning take it out of the, the plastic bag. And when you're done cooking, just slide it into the hot oven. And then when you sit down for dinner, people are like, oh, it's still hot. It's so good. It's like just made. And you know, I would explain, I, I stopped explaining. I'm like, yep, right out of the oven. It, it really tastes delicious after it's been frozen. So if you can make, you know, you can do two yeasts and make four breads, use two and have two frozen for another time. It's what's really the, what's the maximum amount of time that the dough can be refrigerated well as you um you can refrigerate the dough for days but it be, starts to become a fermented sourdough so the the flavor will change but i remember um shula uh once took the dough home from the class and she put it in the refrigerator and then she didn't get to baking it till Sunday. So that's Thursday night till Sunday. And she was like so excited because she had made like a sourdough challah. So the dough will last and the yeast will stay active um, for a couple of days. So like, don't throw it out if you didn't get to it. <laughs> also, if you want to make um, rolls, you could do that. And you, you, if you take three ounces of the dough, and make that round challah like Katja showed you for Rosh Hashanah. You can make a little round one of three ounces of dough and then you get a roll. So you can make individual rolls for people if you want. Which I did. I made my own hamburger rolls out of some of the challah dough. And I put everything seeds on top and then you flatten it a bit and then it grows. So you make a ball and then you flatten it here. I have seeds around, but that's okay. So you roll it like this. So I'm rolling it, there's seeds, which is okay. And then you just flatten it. And then I took seeds. So now you have this round flat and I put a ton of different seeds on it. And we had seeded, we had seed. I didn't do, you can do it without an egg wash or you can also do it with an egg wash, it's up to you. But the seeds stuck. And then I, you just let this rise for like 10 or 15 minutes and you bake them on the parchment and you have hamburger rolls. I never did it for hot dogs because we don't really eat so many hot dogs, but, <laughs> but that's a nice thing to do if you make it two yeast 
and in the in the handouts that were sent there's um a chart with two three like multiple with all the math figured out for you great i have to the poem i don't know who's still on are there still a lot of people on i don't, I don't know i'll have to anyway we have this poem that katja found that i think will be very meaningful now that you've attended the entire class. So I'm gonna read it to you, okay? Everybody ready for a little poetry? It's from Tamar. By a woman named Tamar Frankel, and it's called The Voice of Sarah. Chala, the offering of the dough, the kneading of the bread, folding and turning, the sticky lump of flour and water comes to life in the hand, springs back, lumps becoming smooth, folding and turning, turning and folding, pressing, pushing, punching. There is my love, there is my anger, there is my hurried day's work, there is my relief and my joy. May blessings come to those who receive this chala. Powerful are you, God, who has made us holy, bringing the bread to rise under our hand. Here, a piece to the fire, to the offering, to the Kohanim, our work, our life goes to you. We give before we eat. Shabbat shalom to everybody. Shabbat Email, shalom. whatever Thank questions. You. Thank you to the PA for organizing this. Thank yes, you. thank you. Shabbat shalom. It's a, new, a new experience, but it's wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much. In real life. <laughs>